to my lesson on reproduction in plants. In this lesson, we are going to compare the types of reproduction plants can carry out, and then we're going to look at the life cycle of the plant, from flower, through pollination and fertilisation, the formation and distribution of seeds, and finally the germination of the seed and growth of a new plant. Looking around you, there's such a variety of plants, and I want to try to overcome some of your plant blindness, the groaning when I say we're going to study plants. All my life, I've been fascinated with animals. I even did a degree in animal science. But since then, I've started to look at and study plants. And the more I find out about them, the more respect and interest I have in them. Plants are essential for life on Earth. They are the producers in food chains. In other words, they make their own food using sunlight energy in the process of photosynthesis. So grass makes its own food. A rabbit then comes along and eats the grass, and then a fox eats the rabbit. The fox and the rabbit rely on the grass. Not only that, during this process, plants are absorbing carbon dioxide, a greenhouse gas from the air, and releasing oxygen, which we need for aerobic respiration. Hopefully, lots of you already know that. But did you know that if a plant is under attack from, say, green fly, it can let other plants know by releasing chemicals into the air, and the other plants can respond by producing green fly repellents and by attracting green fly hunting wasps. Other things plants can do, as well as feeding us. Did you know bananas contain a substance that makes us happier? And that the first type of aspirin came from the tree bark of a willow tree? Think about your early morning coffee to keep you awake, the cotton shirt you are wearing, your bagel as you leave the house, the fuel used to get you to school, your books, your seats, your tables. You get the picture. Where would we be without plants? And to keep up the supply of plants, they have to reproduce. So in this lesson, I'm going to cover the topic of reproduction in plants, both asexual and sexual, and then walk you through the life cycle from flower to seed to new plant. So let's get going. Plants carry out two different sorts of reproduction, asexual and sexual. Asexual reproduction is a type of reproduction which does not involve gametes or fertilisation. It just involves one parent cell or cells and they double their number of chromosomes and split into two, producing cells with the original number of chromosomes, a form of cell division known as mitosis. The cell with a normal number of chromosomes is known as diploid, die for chromosomes in pairs. The offspring that arise by asexual reproduction from a single cell or from a multicellular organism are genetically identical to the parents and are said to be clones. The only variation that will occur is due to mutations, a random change in the genetic information. Sexual reproduction does involve gametes, in other words, sex cells. Thinking about the work on specialised cells, gametes, sperm and ova, have half the original number of chromosomes. This is because, like in mitosis, the cell starts by doubling its number of chromosomes, but then it divides not once, but twice. So each of the gametes formed has half the original number of chromosomes. This is known as the haploid number, and I remember this by haploid, H-A, for half, H-A. And the type of cell division involved is meiosis, which you've got to be careful with the spelling of that. I go through this in greater detail in another one of my lessons entirely devoted to cell division. When a male gamete meets a female gamete, fertilisation occurs and a zygote is formed, which now has the original diploid number of chromosomes because half from the sperm plus half from the ovum gives one hole in the zygote. You may have come across the fact that some types of bacteria can double their number every 20 minutes, and you often see this demonstrated in TV adverts for kitchen cleaners. The reason they can increase their numbers so quickly is that they reproduce by a type of asexual reproduction called binary fission. Binary meaning two and fission meaning to split. This means that they are splitting into two every 20 minutes, so double their numbers. And because it doesn't involve gametes and fertilisation, it just involves the splitting of the cell by mitosis. Remember the mitosis? It is much quicker. Yeast can also reproduce rapidly by a type of asexual reproduction called budding. 
Here, small cells form on the side of the original parental cell and then they grow and split off. In plants, asexual reproduction is very useful for taking over new areas of land that are not yet occupied by lots of other plants. Because this form of reproduction only requires one plant and is very quick, if a seed lands in a new area, once it has grown into a fully formed plant, it can undergo asexual reproduction to spread quickly. This is very useful, but there is a downfall. If you remember, I said asexual reproduction leads to clones. So if this plant is susceptible to a disease and then this disease spreads to this area, whole plant colonies can be wiped out. This has been a problem with cloned banana plants, which are susceptible to a disease called black cigatoka. You need to know several examples of asexual reproduction in plants. So here are the main examples you need to know. First of all, a plant I grow very successfully in my lab, the spider plant, reproduces asexually by sending out runners, which are also known as stolons, on which the smaller plants, plantlets, grow. These smaller plants develop roots, and when they are heavy enough, they touch the soil and form a separate plant. Strawberries also send out plantlets on their runners, but they grow over the surface of the soil, and at certain points they grow small roots known as adventitious roots, which grow into the soil and take over the function of the main root of the plant. Eventually, for both spider plants and strawberries, the stem that grew the plantlets from the original plant dies and the new plant is established. Strawberry plants can be grown asexually by allowing plantlets on the ends of the runners to grow in the soil. But the actual strawberries are the result of sexual reproduction as they grow from flowers. I'm sure you have kept potatoes in your vegetable wrap for a little longer than normal. If you have, you will see sprouts growing out from their eyes. These grow and if planted in soil will give rise to the plant stems and from there all the other parts of the plant will grow. Underground, the shoots will grow stolons, which grow outwards, from which new tubers will be formed. Bulbous plants like daffodils, tulips and onions will split through the bulb, forming smaller bulbs called bulblets. Or they can develop very tiny bulbs on the stem, called bulb bills. We can use asexual reproduction in plants to our own advantage in a process called artificial asexual reproduction. We carry this out in this biology lab at school and what we do is we take cuttings. We tend to use geraniums as they are easy to cultivate. First of all, you take a healthy adult plant. You find a good strong branch this plant and simply cut it off. You then place this cutting into rooting powder and into soil. Or the way we tend to do it at school is to make a solution up in a jam jar using rooting hormone gel and place the cutting through a piece of card on top of the jam jar. So just the end of the cutting is sitting in the solution. Over a couple of weeks, this plant that grows roots and then it is ready to plant into its own pot of soil. This is used by many garden centres so that they get lots of the same plant in a short period of time. The advantage is that they know what the plant will end up looking like as it is a clone of the parent and it is relatively cheap and easy. Looking at a summary of asexual versus sexual reproduction, there are advantages and disadvantages of both. Asexual only requires one parent. So if the plant is landed in a new area where there are no other plants, it can still reproduce. It is quick so the plants can colonise the area rapidly, but they are more susceptible to disease due to lack of genetic variation. Sexual reproduction, on the other hand, requires two parents, and each parent produces sex cells or gametes, which contain half the normal number of chromosomes. So when fertilisation occurs, each parent contributes half the genetic information. This leads to variation, which means the plants are more able to adapt to changes in the environment. But sexual reproduction takes much longer, which means it does not allow them to colonise new areas of land easily. I want to introduce you to the flower, the reproductive organ of the plant. Some flowers are really beautiful with bright colours and wonderful scents. These tend to be insect pollinated flowers, although some are pollinated by bats, birds and other small animals. 
Many flowers have petals which have UV lines on them running from the petal tip to the centre of the flower and this guides the insects in like a landing strip for an aeroplane. Let's look at the diagram of a typical insect pollinated flower. At the base of the flower is the receptacle where the stem meets the flower. The stem supports the flower in a suitable position for it to be pollinated. A bud forms when a flower is developing and this is protected by sepals which are often green. The petals are usually large, brightly coloured and sweetly smelling to attract insects. Stamens, the male sex organs, are made up of the pollen producing anther and the filament that supports the anther at just the right height to brush against an insect's body as it enters and leaves the flower. The pollen is often spiked so it can stick to the tiny hairs on the insect's body. The carpal is the female sex organ and consists of the ovary style and stigma. The sticky stigma pulls the pollen off the insects as they enter the flower and the style supports the stigma and connects the stigma to the ovary. The ovary contains the ovules which harbour the haploid ova. Insect pollinator flowers in addition usually have a nectary to produce sugary nectar to entice the insects into the flower. Other flowers you might not even realise are flowers, such as these grass flowers or catkins on trees. These do not need to be bright or as noticeable and they won't smell as they rely on the wind to pollinate them, so they don't need to attract insects. This is a diagram of a wind pollinated flower. They are not brightly coloured and their petals are often small as they are not trying to attract insects. The anthers hang outside the flower to catch the wind so that the pollen can be blown to another flower. They produce far more pollen than insect pollinated flowers and the pollen is much smaller and lighter and some even have air pockets. These flowers have a feathery stigma which also dangles outside the flower, ready to catch pollen as it blows by. So what is pollination you may ask? Well pollination is the transfer of the pollen, which contains the male sex cell or gamete, from the male sex organ, the anther, to the stigma of the female sex organ. It is not the same as fertilisation. Many flowers have both male and female parts on one flower and are known as perfect flowers. Others may only have the male or the female parts and they're known as imperfect flowers, such as the holly bush. To get holly berries, you must have a male plant in the same region as the female. The pollen can be transferred from an anther to the stigma of a different flower, known as cross-pollination, demonstrated here by Boris the bee. Or it can be transferred to the stigma of the same flower, known as self-pollination. But for fertilisation to occur, the flower has to be of the same species. Cross-pollination is favourable as it leads to a greater genetic variation and hence greater chance of adaptation to changes in the environment. However, self-pollination is useful for isolated plants. Plants and insects have a mutualistic relationship, but what do I mean by this? Well, we know that the flowers attract the insects so they can get pollinated, so they can then reproduce and make more plants. But what do the insects get? At the base of the flowers are nectaries that produce a sugar-rich liquid called nectar, which is a food for the insects. If you think about some of the best-known pollinators, bees, they feed on the nectar and pollen of flowers. Worker bees, whose job it is to collect food for the colony, land on flowers and drink the nectar. This nectar is then stored in a pouch-like internal structure called the crop. They collect pollen into sac-like structures on their legs called pollen baskets. The bees then fly back to the colonies. They regurgitate the nectar, mixed with enzymes, and expose the mixture to the air for several days, creating honey. Mmm, that sounds delicious. This honey is then used to feed the colony. Pollen is mixed with nectar to form a protein-rich substance called bee bread, which is then used to feed the young larvae. So there we have it, a mutualistic relationship. When a pollen grain lands on a stigma of the same species, a pollen tube may start to grow really rather rapidly. Maize pollen tubes can grow at a rate of about one centimetre an hour. The pollen tube is attracted towards the ovary due to the release of a chemical signal. This long tube grows through the style and will reach the ovary, which it enters through a small opening called the micropile. The nucleus of the pollen grain then passes down the tube to fuse with the nucleus of an ovum in fertilisation to form the diploid zygote. The ovule now starts to develop into the seed. The zygote develops into the embryonic plant made up of a small root, the radical, and the shoot, the plumule. There are seed leaves called cotyledons. 
Some seeds have one leaf, known as monocotyledons, or monocots for short, and some have two leaves, known as dicots. The seed also contains a food store, either in the cotyledons or in another part of the seed. This is ready for when the plant starts to germinate. The ovule wall develops into the seed coat, or tester. The fruit usually develops from the ovary wall, but it may also develop from other parts of the flower too. Fruits provide a method of seed dispersal. Dispersal is the transfer of a seed away from the parent plant. It is necessary to avoid large numbers of seeds from the parent plant competing with each other and the parent plant for water, minerals, space and light. This increases the chance of survival for the plant. This is a dandelion clock which is composed of cylindrical seeds each with a long stalked parachute to aid its dispersal. I wanted to talk to you about the dandelion as many students get confused between wind pollination and wind seed dispersal when talking about this particular flower. This is a dandelion flower head and it consists of many tiny flowers called florets. It is bright yellow for a very good reason, because it is insect pollinated, so it has to attract the insects so it, that it can complete its life cycle. When fertilisation has occurred, each floret develops into a seed, and because there's so many florets on the flower, we get this dandelion clock. When a gust of wind comes along, the seeds are dispersed by the wind and they drift off away from where the parent plant is growing. So that is an example of wind dispersal. Now let's look at the other main ways. Another example of wind dispersal is the sycamore helicopter which has wings. Plants that produce windblown seeds often produce lots of them to ensure that some are blown to areas where they can germinate. Some will get eaten and some will land in places that are not a suitable habitat for the plant. Many plants that live near or in water have seeds that can float and so they are carried by water to new habitats. Some are very large seeds like coconuts and some are smaller like the water iris. With animal dispersal there are several variations in technique. Some, like the burdock, get stuck to the animal fur and carry to a new location. Other plants, such as strawberries and blackberries, produce their seeds with delicious fleshy fruits that then get eaten by an animal. The seeds pass through the digestive tract and are dropped in other locations in faeces. Some animals bury seeds, like squirrels with acorns. It's to save for later, but they often can't find them, so they end up growing into new plants. The explosive method of dispersal involves violently ejecting them so that they fall away from the parent plant. The seed pods dry in the sun and this causes tension in the wall of the pod, eventually causing it to split. As the pod breaks open, it flicks the seeds out in an explosive manner, for example the lupin. Gorse also does this and if you sit near gorse bushes on a hot day, it's like sitting near a firing range as the exploding pods sound almost like gunshots. So what have we learned in this lesson? Well, there's two types of reproduction in plants, asexual and sexual. The flowers contain the sex organs. Insect pollinated flowers are bright, they have scent and they have nectar. And the anther and sticky stigma are inside the flower and the pollen is normally larger and spiky and produced in smaller numbers. Whereas the wind pollinated flowers have small or no petals and the anthers and feathery stigma are outside the flower. Pollination is the transfer of pollen from the anther to the stigma and it can be cross-pollination or self-pollination. Fertilisation occurs once the nuclei of the pollen grains get to the ova in the ovules. The ovule becomes a seed and the ovary usually becomes a fruit. Seed is dispersed by wind, animal, water or self. Seed remains dormant until conditions are right. Wow! Water enters the seed and with warmer temperatures breaks dormancy and food stores are broken down. The plumule and the radical grow. The dry mass decreases until the shoot gets above ground and the plant begins to photosynthesize. And this is the end of germination. 
So don't forget those really important buzzwords and how to spell them, which I've made a slight mistake with there because I've forgotten the S for sepal. Now, I like to give a stretch and challenge and this isn't really a stretch and challenge, but it is about, the, it is some books that you might find interesting. I've read them both and found them fascinating. The History of Bees by Maya Lundy is a story that follows three generations of beekeepers from the past when there's a biologist who's still uh, discovering a type of beehive through uh, 2007 in the United States when they are battling modern farming to save the bees and then China in 2098 where they're actually having to paint pollen onto the fruit trees because there aren't any pollinators left. So that's quite a, a severe, serious book to read. Or there's The Bees by Laline Paul, who follows Flora 717, a sanitation bee. And it is a story about her interactions with the queen bee and the rest of the hive. This really does teach you about the different roles bees have in the hive and how the queen is selected. I've just finished reading it and I found it fascinating. Two books about bees, but very, very different. I hope you've enjoyed this lesson and I hope to see you for more.